this week on the Back Table Podcast. I'm telling you, there's just you, there's just so much you can talk about this stuff because the you can layer. I mean, for simple procedures, you can layer on the complexity and people and like G tubes is one of those things where people feel differently about it and they and it's interesting because not only they feel differently but they feel strongly about the way they do it. Yeah. And so that's what I've always found interesting about G tubes is like not only like do people differ on their practice patterns, but they're like this is why I do it. And if you don't do it this way, peritonitis and death is right around the corner. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. That's why I, I think like having this and like having the commentary will be very fun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Since I had my son, paying down my med school debt has become my top priority. I remember holding him in my arms for the first time, looking into his beautiful little face, and just wanting the best future for him. With the Laurel Road Student Loan Cashback Card, my regular purchases earn me 2% cashback when I use it to pay down my student loans, which helps me reach my goals faster and plan for my family's future. Laurel Road for Doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank and a member FDIC. Now, back to the episode. Uh, excited to be recording from Paris, France. I got a good friend and colleague, uh, Chris Beck, on as my guest today. Chris, how's it going over there in New Orleans? Good, good. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for having me on the podcast. Excited to be talking about G-Tubes today. Yeah, we're going to talk about G-Tubes. I, you know what I was doing before we started recording? I went back and I listened to episode number like two or three, the one with two. Um, Bream and Brandis. Yeah. And oh my gosh, those poor guys, it's the audio is so bad. And thank you, Peter Bream and Aaron Brandis, if you're listening for, for, um, toughing through that, but, uh, it was a good episode. Those guys talked about techniques that I don't use actually, you know, Peter was my program director at Vanderbilt. So I did learn the bag technique, the balloon assisted gastrostomy, but when I got it in practice, it just wasn't practical. And so, um, I think you and I do G tubes very similarly which we're going to get into. I did also go back and watch your YouTube video, which I highly recommend. And I don't know if you, do you guess how many views you have of that video. 5,000. 11,000. Over 11,000. Pretty amazing. I think man. like, As yeah, a, I think maybe like 20 of them are me and then 50 of them are my and mom. Then your mom. And then so, Sherry. <laughs> and then it's hard to account for the other 9,000. Yeah. No, and it's then a Sherry, great and then video. Sherry, and then like, Sherry's family. Sherry's family might account for about 100. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Either way, there's thousands of docs that have listened to it and watched it and, and gotten some out of it. And, and we're going to dive into a lot of that. But as you know, back table, we like to discuss these things and sometimes little tips and tricks come out of it when we're able to get into it. So that's what we're going to do. You know, the other, the other thing I want to talk about was Aaron, real quick before we get started is Aaron Brandis's technique, which is the pull through technique. Have you ever, had you ever done that? Yeah, we were trained on the pull technique. Um, we had so many different attendings at Georgetown. We rotated through a couple different hospitals, and one of the docs there used the pull technique. Yeah, it's not exactly how Brandis does it, but yeah, uh, trained in it. And it, it's like one of those things. Like I know how to do the balloon assisted gastrostomy. I know how to do the pull technique, but just what ended up what ended up working better for my practice was just you know standard peel away sheath and dumping in a G tube. Yeah, yeah. Once I got out in practice and I kind of saw how some of my partners were doing it and, you know, and we're going to get into kits and all that stuff, but uh, I realized that there was a very efficient way to do it. And when you have a, you know, trained techs who know what to hand you next and you kind of, and you know, you, you have a, a protocol that uh, you go by every single time, it, it, get, it becomes pretty smooth, but you know, things can happen, things can go wrong. And so that's the that's what we're going to do today is kind of talk through the, from the basics to a little bit more advanced stuff. So first of all, let's just start at the beginning. Where in your practice do these patients usually come from? Who are they referred by? So a lot of our patients are referred from radiation oncology uh, slash ENT, patients with head and neck cancer. And so it's like head and neck malignancy, standard uh, G2 before they start radiation and surgery to get them some nutrition or get them ready to get extra nutrition. And then 80% of those are outpatient. And then we have about 
I say 80, maybe 90% of those are outpatient. And then 10% of our patients are inpatient referrals. There's a OMSF doc who does like these complex head and neck reconstructions, usually for malignancy, sometimes for benign disease. And those patients are sent to us, same reason, you know, just feeding G-tube. Got it. Yeah. Similar, you know, in our practice, uh, a few of our hospitals are trauma centers, stroke centers. So a lot of times it's um, stroke patients or trauma patients who are kind of, you know, failure to thrive, need a way to get some nutrition. Sometimes we'll get a head and neck cancer patient and they tend to be a little bit more, you know, they're, you know, more kind of walkie, walkie talkie and, and you have more of an in-depth conversation with them about the tube itself. Usually we're talking to family about the tube and how to take care of it. So let's talk a little bit about the, so I kind of touched on it was indications, but you know, I mentioned, Hold on. do you get, do you get any move? Do you get any, do you get any movement disorders or like venting G2 referrals? Very rarely. Uh, but yeah, that has happened same. as well. Very rarely. Yeah, same, it's same. mostly, yeah, mostly stroke to be honest. And yeah. And maybe like people who have had a neck or either have an obstructing mass or they're like post radiation or something like that. Actually, I have a question, like going back to referrals, like, do you compete with gastroenterology or does, is it like a collaborative approach with GI or, yeah, I was just curious about the referral or like the relationship with GI? Yeah, I would say it's more collaborative because I would say hospitalists tend to just find whoever can do it fastest and they want, because they want to get the patient out of the hospital, they want to get the patient placed, right? So they want to get them out of inpatient. So gastrostomy tube, a lot of time is is the thing that's holding them up before they go to LTAC or, you know, some sort of sniff placement. And so I would say it's more collaborative and and sometimes, you know, they, they try, they fail, they ask us to try or vice versa. And uh, it, it, so yeah, most of them are coming via the hospitalist, maybe a neurologist and, and or oncology. Oh, when you say vice versa, you mean you fail and then send it to GI? We, well, I say we, it, we might fail and send them actually to surgery. So oh, okay. that's a good gotcha. point. Not, not GI. Because usually if we fail, then it, there's not a percutaneous option, right. then surgery will have to do it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. We never fail though, right? I was about um, to say, I was like, man, I, I, <laughs> like it's, it's almost sometimes like, you know, IR is a mentality, like never say die. And I feel like yeah. I never send a surgery or, or GI, but I mean, usually it's a it scheduling thing. Usually it's like, whoever yeah, can yeah, get yeah, to yeah. it fastest, which is okay. good. Um, yeah. I will also say to my, to our GI guys credit, like the ones that I work with the hospital, they, they rarely, rarely fail. Like there's like, we used to get referrals all the time in fellowship for like failure to transilluminate. And I absolutely never see, well, I say never see that. I saw it twice with one of their younger partners and I got the referral for like failure to transilluminate. And I, I called uh, one of the guys I know, not the uh, doc that referred it to me. And he was, I wouldn't say he was mortified, but he was like, he's like, no, 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 let me take a look at it. Let me take a look. And then they had put a new G-tube in that patient, like within like an hour and a half. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. they, they, they don't, they also like the GI docs that I work with take a lot of pride in that like they do not like to have to send to me. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a healthy competitive relationship, right. I would say. Yeah. No. I yeah. And, and and that's a good thing. I mean, I, I think that it's for sure. There have been toxic cultures where it's more of a dumping kind of thing, you know, Friday afternoon. Oh, the, you know, they gotta get GI punted it all week and then they gotta get them out before the weekend and all of a sudden it's on our plate. And um sure, those are always sure. annoying. But that's rare. You know, I, we appreciate our GI colleagues. And so, you know, how about, let's say, let's talk about contraindications when it's really can't do it. What would you say are the big ones? Uncorrectable coagulopathy, which, you know, in my, in my practice, I do not see ascites. If there's something in the way, um, like an ascites picture with like peritoneal carcinomatosis, but those are the ones that kind of like and, and I have to admit, I, I don't see uncorrectable coagulopathy. I'm not saying it wouldn't be there, like with some practice patterns, but not mine. And then, um, yeah, there's something interposed between the stomach wall and then the uh, the, the actual stomach. Yeah, because a lot of the times... Also doesn't patients, happen very much. Yeah, right. You know, the colon's in the way, you know, liver's in the way, um, or it's just high up under the costal margin, under the ribs. 
those those would be the anatomic reasons. The anticoagulation thing comes very often because a lot of times they're stroke patients, so they're either they're on aspirin or some sort of anticoagulation. As long as you know, if it was like an ischemic stroke, that would be the main thing. Yeah, we that we just a lot of times are just waiting waiting for them to be off aspirin or Plavix or something like that. And are they? I assume uh, that they're bridging them in between that, right? Yeah, usually they bridge them. You know, if they were on, yeah, uh, they'll, they'll bridge them on heparin or Lovenox. That's pretty much it. I, I would agree with you. You know, anatomy, although rare. So, so what do you do about anatomy, right? So, a lot of times we review, we review studies. We look and see have they had a CT. A lot of times with the trauma patients, they've had a pan scan, so you can just look back. You know, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago. Does the stomach look like it's in a in a decent place for a, an open window? What do you do uh, routinely do a CT before if they don't have one? Ninety five percent of the time they have one because you know these are head and neck patients and a lot of times they'll get worked up with some kind of cross sectional imaging to like do a staging exam. But if I don't have anything, like every now and then it's from an outside institution, I'll actually get one day of the procedure. I think there's a lot of ways around this. One, I don't think it's entirely necessary. I get it. It makes me feel better. And I know a lot of people will just say, oh, get a cone beam when you're on the table, which is also an option. But I'll usually just when they're in the pre-procedure area getting worked up, it's like we just we have our patients come in so early. I think they come in like two hours before the procedure. So it's just not that hard to get like a non kind of the abdomen for me. Like it doesn't delay my start or anything. But if for some reason we had a tighter pre-op window, I think I would just do a cone beam on the table. But that does make okay. me feel better having a little cross-sectional imaging to know that I have a nice safe access window. Yeah. And in the video you mentioned, you get, you, they get barium. Is that, that's also routine? Yeah, that's for me is routine. And it's, it's still negotiable. Like every now and then we'll have a patient that shows up that either they were a little bit confused on when to drink it or just didn't want to drink it or had trouble getting it down. And I'll still put them on the table and I can still see the colon, but it's just, it's just so nice to have that colon outlined in, in black whenever you're doing, have them on the table. And once it becomes kind of like one of the things you look for, whenever it's not opacified, it's always has to be like front of my mind, like being like, oh, where is the colon? I just have to locate it before I get going. Yeah. So yeah, like having, having them take the barium beforehand is kind of like the, um, it feels almost like idiot proof. Yeah, I, w- I would agree. I mean, most of the time you can... S- the colon has gas in it and you can s- sort of make it out uh, even if they haven't had barium. I would say in my practice or the the hospitals that I cover, getting a CT ahead of time can be kind of a pain. So a lot of times it's just, you get them, you get them on the table, you take a look at where the colon is. And then when you start pumping up the stomach, usually it pushes the colon out of the way and you yeah. can kind of watch it. But uh, the, the CT thing is, it, it to me, yeah, it's peace of mind. It's like okay, this looks like mm-hmm. a clear cut. There's an open window, and then uh, sometimes when the stomach, you know, it's like a little lady in the stomach's way up under the rib cage. I, I'll just say, hey, look, th- I don't see an open window. Chances are, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get one. Why don't you just have, you know, general surgery? I don't know. You know, it's it's tough, but like sometimes they it, this or they have that big hiatal hernia. You don't even know that. Right? Yeah, and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, have have surgery. Take a look at this patient. Yeah. What about the post-op stomach? Like, do you ever get like a gastric remnant that gets referred to you? Yes, we have. And and as long, again, as long as it looks like there's uh, a good window, I'm more than happy to, to, you know, give it a shot. Um, yeah, never really here. turn, here. never turn one of those down. The, well, we'll get into a little bit later. The only thing that I get that I don't like doing on, initially is GJ tubes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sure. If they want like a fresh GJ, I'll, I'll offer a fresh G. And then to convert one or two weeks later, but I want to get I don't want to get too off onto the GJs. So what you know? So anyway, workups done. Patients looking like a good candidate for G tube. Get them down. What do you do when they first get over onto the table? So I'll throw this out there, and I know it's going to be different than so many interventional radiologists, but I use Mac. Like I'll get anesthesia involved for a lot of my patients, and. I know it's different. I know that I could safely uh, anesthetize these guys 80 to 90% of the time. But a lot of my patients are like these bad head and neck cancers. And sometimes even when you go to check like their myelin potty score, it looks like they have a nice myelin potty. But then you, if you look at their cross-sectional, like, you know, their larynx is completely eaten up by tumor. So it just, 
there's two reasons. One, I like using anesthesia. Like I, I know the G2 is not particularly painful, but like anesthesia can put them out. They can do their thing. Our, my anesthesia colleagues are also like very good about getting the NG tube in, which is my least favorite part mm. of the procedure. So they'll get like yeah. everything teed up, patient super, super comfortable. The NG tube placement, one, it happens when I'm not in the room, so it saves me a little bit of time. And then also it happens while they're under anesthesia. And so from the patient's perspective, it seems like, like completely seamless. You know, they just go to bed and then wake up after. They don't remember any of that stuff. So the first thing I do when I get in the room is just get scrubbed up and get ready to go. I do have ultrasound prep, so I will mark the liver margins, but I've gotten away from marking it before I insufflate the stomach. Like I'll go ahead and insufflate the stomach and then I'll, I don't even mark the liver margins. I just kind of like find out where I want to go onto the stomach and then I'll just check that area with ultrasound and a little bit above it, a little bit to the side, you know, I'm just kind of like screening the area that I want to go. Like I don't necessarily have to identify exactly where the liver is. Yeah. I think that probably saves a little bit of time. I mean, uh, just to go back to the sedation, I mm -hmm. use moderate sedation on all patients. I don't know if I can't think of when I had when I ever used a Mac because they just I don't know they just tolerate it really well. And usually they're older patients and they're kind of lightweights, right? They don't require much. You just got to be careful. But that being said, it's not a like. It, it can be quick and easy, but it's, I mean, you know, you're sticking that big old tube into their stomach. It's not a totally benign procedure. And so if you think that they're going to be squirming or they're not going to be able to tolerate it, then yeah, I would probably get anesthesia involved. And then the, that's a good point with the head and neck cancer patients because they've, they're already going through a lot and you want them to be very comfortable as well going through it because they're not, you know, it, again, it, it can be a very painful procedure. So I think I have used it. I have used anesthesia when it comes to head and neck cancer patients, when I just want them to be completely out. When it comes to the liver, they put the patient on the floor table. And that, that's the first thing I do is I take ultrasound. And I, I create that little triangle. I yeah. draw a line along the, the left margin of the liver and I draw a line along I feel the costal margin draw and I create my little triangle and that way I know my like my safety zone you know where I can go and then I start insufflating the stomach because after that but wait just to st take a step back a lot of patients come down already with an NG tube in but when they don't then either myself or sometimes we have a skilled tech who'll put the, a company down right I saw in your, your video, in your G2 video, you, it was a company. Is that, did you place that? I probably didn't either. Anesthesia will still use like a company. Um, oh, like okay. they're, they're comfortable. Yeah. They're comfortable using the company if they don't have like one of their own NG tubes or if it's like the, or they think it's going to be like an obstructing lesion or sometimes yeah. like it's actually kind of, a, I don't want to put it all on anesthesia because it's kind of collaborative effort. Like a lot of my techs and even some of the nurses, like a lot of them feel comfortable, like giving it a go with the NG tube every now and then they have some trouble with one and um, they'll get me to place it. But for a majority of my patients, like the NG tubes already in by the time I get in the room. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think that's yeah, sometimes it's really the nice. most annoying part. It, it really is, especially yeah. if they're not uh, sedated. And, you know, so I always give them some sedation before we even start that. But a lot of times, you know, it's the baby dose, it's the one in 50. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, they're not totally asleep. And it's kind of one of the worst parts of the procedure. So they're already like all aggravated and upset. So you're right. And and then sometimes they have, you know, a torturous esophagus or a patulous right. esophagus. And, and it's hard to get it all the way down. And then what I'll do, I'll, I'll grab a glide wire and yeah. use that to the, use the company and the glide to direct it to get past any you know any areas because a lot of times they, they they can't swallow or they're not willing to swallow so you actually have to look lateral and see okay i gotta put i gotta direct this posteriorly so i can get past the epiglottis yeah i never actually look lateral i usually have the patients like i'll put it in the nose and then push their head all the way away from me and then, you know, just kind of keep probing posteriorly and then eventually it'll go. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is a little bit, I mean, that to me is like the kind of the worst part of the procedure, which is another reason I like having, like having them sedated and, you know, out for this part. Or sometimes they're gagging depending on like what you're accessing. But, you know, for the most part, they don't remember any of that. Yeah. Now, are you giving glucagon? Yes. Always give a milligram of glucagon. There are plenty of patients where I probably do not have to give glucagon, but... They have it pulled, ready to go. And before we start insufflating, milligram of glucagon before we get going. Absolutely. Okay. Do you? 
I, I don't. I don't, you know, I guess it's offered, but I just don't find it that usually I I do it. I'm pretty speedy about my G-tubes because once they mm -hmm. start in, insufflating that stomach, I'm getting access real quick because I don't want that air all in the small bowel and everything. And so, because I don't want them to have to pump it up again. So I just don't. I just try and I just kind of streamlined my my workflow so that I'm just kind of getting that access real quick, getting those TTACs in. Because it's it's for hypermotility, basically, right? You're it's right. just to slow everything yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, I think if I saw that somebody, like the gas was just going right through them, then I might stop, give glucagon so that we can kind of, you know, get some air to sit in, sit in the stomach. But usually I don't. What about antibiotics? Yes. At this point, yeah. I, I feel like SIR has done such a good job with that app that... Just go to the app. If you have a question about antibiotics, go to the app. But yeah, so I give antibiotics pre-procedure, just SAR guidelines, pretty standard. Yeah, I mean, it's a dirty procedure. So, you know, you're you're crossing blood vessels and you're getting into the stomach. And I think it makes sense to do antibiotics prophylactically. We usually do, I think, a gram of ANCEF. is the one or two grams, depending on the patient's size. Okay, what's on your back table? What kit do you use? So... The kit is like kind of a compilation of things. Like the T fasteners, I think are from. They used to be from Kimberly Clark. I think they're from yeah. Avanos. Is it pronounced Avanos? Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I was thinking, yeah, because I I looked back at the, your video and it was it is Avanos. Yeah, yeah. It used to be Kimberly uh, Clark. You're right. Right. So those T fasteners, I think those are really slick, easy to use. Yeah. They they come with one extra. So if you drop one on the ground or you think one has some bad juju, you can use another one. And then I like the uh, Coons dilator set. I think that is from Boston side, but I'm not positive. So the set that we have uh, comes with maybe 20, 20, 22, 24 dilators, or maybe it's 22, 24, 26 dilators. I kind of forgot, but they're uh, really slick hydrophilic dilators. And then uh, peel away sheath. Um, it comes with a couple different options. I think the has a 22 and a 24 peel away sheath. And then mm -hmm. I'll have a 20 French G tube on the table. Oh, you start with a 20. Okay. So actually, we we used to we used to do sixteen French G tubes, and our radiation oncologist uh, came to us and asked us if we would just start putting twenty French G tubes in. A lot of I say a lot, you know, quote unquote, a lot, a handful of patients were uh, getting blocked up G tubes, and Radonc thought that if we just started with twenty French, that might solve some problems. And our radiation oncologist asked very very little from us, and like yeah, and so you know we decided to give it a go, and and truly like. Um, like we followed up with them maybe six months afterwards and like, is this making a difference? And they're like, it's a huge difference for us. And so yeah. we just go straight to the 20 French, which I have to admit 20 French is not for me, I not ideal. Like it changed the procedure just a little bit. Whenever you're doing that 24 French peel away sheath and it's, it just, there's a little bit more like kind of pushing. It's just mm -hmm. not as much of a finesse deal as like when you're dealing with a 20 French peel away for a 16 French tube. And and for those out there, or actually, I'm interested to hear what you say. I always have to go four French sizes bigger than the actual gastrostomy tube. Okay, for your placement. Yeah, are are you doing just two? No, 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 no. You're right because otherwise it gets hung up because of that balloon. Right. You know, mm -hmm. they do have some low profile balloons that supposedly can like if you do a, a 20 French peel away, you can do an 18 uh, French G tube or you know an 18 French peel away for a 16 G tube. Yeah, I I use the cook set that, but it's like hydrophilic, you know, dilators with the, the peel away sheets, and I just I'm routinely an 18 French G two placer, and so I use the kit that comes with the the 22 peel away, and so um, it's again it's four. is it the is it the telescoping? No, 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 it's a hydrophilic kit. It might be because I think it's the same as the one that you showed in your G two video. Yeah, um, but it's made by Cook. Okay, I think actually mine is Cook. Now that I think about it, yeah, it's made by Cook. It's um, yeah. It, when that came out, I had a partner that love. He still to this day loves the um, transitional dilator, which is oh horrible. I I almost rather do pull through technique than use that thing. <laughs> Some Just people love it. Some people love it. I don't. It's because you got to gel it up. Yeah. And then when you gel it up, you're trying to push the, the telescoping pieces down, and it just slips out of your fingers and. So I just, it's just so easy. You're literally, 
it's like three dilators and you're done within like five minutes. I mean, it, it, it they just made it so easy. It works mm -hmm. really well. I agree with you. The 24, to go from a 22 PLA to a 24, there's something you just got to push harder. Just doesn't yep. go as in as smooth. And we don't get many complaints about G, you know, 18 French G tubes clogging. Not to say it doesn't happen, but if it does, we can always upsize it later sure. to a 20. What's that tracks form? But yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I use is the cook set and a, you know, super stiff amplots. Sorry, super stiff amplots wire. Yeah. Uh, anything else that's on your back table? No, I mean, you know, after that, it's just syringes. I'll usually have them. Yeah. I usually have the ultrasound gel from the sterile pro. And so I like having that. Like I don't gel up anything except for the gastrostomy tube, but I do yeah. put a little uh, lubrication on the outside of the gastrostomy tube. I will say also, like I use the uh, the Coons dilator set and I dilate up to 24 for the 24 French peel. Or actually, I think, I I'm sorry, I dial up to dilate up to 26. I just go straight to the 26 mm. dilator. Like they have like yeah. a really, really smooth taper it's on them. Transitional. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just go right to the 26, which I'm not saying it's, it's not right or wrong in that respect, but I just like going single dilator and then, you know, you don't lose as much air because sometimes it's a battle. Like you're, you're trying to get the, the tube and every, and the peel away in quickly before you're losing a whole lot of air through like a really dilated right. skin site. Yeah. So let's just like talk through, okay. You know, the, the company or the NG tubes down, your borders are marked, you insufflate the stomach, somebody's insufflating the stomach at the nose. And, you know, the stomach's insufflated, you, you start with your lidocaine, right? Let's start from the lidocaine and just walk through. Yeah, so use lidocaine. Some people use ripivacaine or bupivacaine. Usually it's lidocaine on my back table, but yeah. I use lidocaine also. Yeah, so once I have the stomach insufflated, uh, I'll check the liver margins and then I'll put the hemostats on the patient, like over the, where I want to enter the stomach. And once I've kind of identified exactly where I want to be and the stomach's insufflated to an adequate degree, and I'm, it's usually about, seems to be like half a liter is like the magic number, but that'll bring the stomach down usually below the, the costal margin and give me a nice safe access window, check the colon. And then I do boom, 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 lidocaine with like skin wheels at three separate, like all the spots. So I, I anesthetize all three spots and then get rid of the lidocaine and then scalpel, scalpel, scalpel for the, the two T-tacks and then the single spot in the middle for where the gastrostomy tube's gonna go. And then mm -hmm. I'll take the hemostats and then I'll spread open that skin nick for the gastrostomy tube. Like that's, the, that's like one of the most annoying things when you make your skin incision too small. And so always make sure that's like sized appropriately. And then I yeah. dilate down or, you know, like I'm dissecting down. And then with the gastropexy tacks, I'll do half a syringe of contrast. So it's like, it's only half full. And then I like yeah. it connected to like a little short connection tubing, not a, not a mini bore, but like a, a nice hearty connection tubing and not too long where I can put that T-tack down on the, the skin surface. I seat it just a little bit and then I can still check with fluoro while keeping my hands out of it. Like when I'm directly going down right. the stomach, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you got two T tacks in. The, the only difference, I, I just do three T tacks, and that's just because for me, it's like ten extra seconds, and it just confirms that I have that stomach up against the wall. So when I, I don't, I just feel like I don't have as hard a time dilating and getting the tube, you know, the peel away in. But if the real state is limited in that my window is small, then I'll just do T -t 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 two T tacks. Yeah, I think three is fine. Um, three is good. Most people I know do two. Yeah, yeah, most people okay. I know do too. I, it, my texts are always like, "What's this three stuff? It's excessive." And I'm like, "No, trust me, man. I it, <laughs> it helps me." Yeah, I might even try the three on like an obese patient because if yeah, you're telling me yeah. it gives me more pushability, yeah, like whenever that peel away sheath is going in, that actually does sound appealing to me. But I've always done two, and, and two kind of gets it in. Now, every now and then, the reason I was thinking I'm open to three is there's every now and then when I'm putting that uh, peel away in, and I'll pop a T-tack like when I'm putting it in. Yes, and so, exactly. Yeah, and so having three um, doesn't seem like a, a bad idea. I think that just like speaks to one of the reasons like how we do it differently and how a lot of people do this differently is that there's just so many good, efficient ways to put in a gastrostomy tube. And none of them are right, none of them yeah. are wrong, and everyone's got their own reasons why they do their things, but like, there's just so many roads that get you to the exact same spot, which is like a safe, effective G-tube. 
Well, and that's the whole thing. I mean, I, I learned it a completely different way in fellowship. And the way I do it now, I learned entirely from my partners and from experience in trials and tribulations and, you know, trying new things, learning things from texts, and you just learn it over time. And so that's why I hope people kind of pick up a thing or two from from our discussion. You know, it's a great point about the obese thing. I mean, you live in Louisiana. I, I you know, I practice in Texas. It most of those G tubes are obese people, um, and you know, either suffered a stroke or, or trauma. And it's but when it's a skinny, real skinny, you know, f small female or male, I will usually just do two T tacks because I don't need you know, it's just not necessary. Sure. That stomach's already very close to the wall, so uh, that's a great point that you brought up. So I want to know this is a, this I think is important. What direction are you directing when you're going to, to you have your T tax in? You're putting your your needle mm -hmm. in for for the actual G tube access in the middle of those. T -tacks. Oh, hold on. I, what I direction to, are you going? I wanted to back up and ask you, like, when you're putting in your T tax, are you just straight AP, like going straight down, or do you ever rotate in the REO and do the stomach tenting? So I have the I have the the tube straight AP and I'm actually coming from an angle. So mm -hmm. I know you go straight down, but what I do is actually, I do watch it, but my fingers are out of the frame and you know, just like I'm aiming my, just to give it away, but just like I'm aiming, I'm aiming every single needle towards the, the antrum. And when I get my needle in, even my T-tech needle in, I pull back for gas to get gas and mm -hmm. I inject contrast to see the, the, the Rue guy and confirm that I'm interluminal before I deploy that T2, uh, T-TAC. And so I'm all, I, I, I just always have it AP. I, I noticed from your video that the way you do it, and that I, I think that's clever so that you can basically watch it tend. So I, I will say, so if anyone goes and watches a video, we've referenced it a couple of times, I'll put it in the REO and I'll, I'll watch that stomach tent. But actually, I've kind of gotten away from that. I, I thought it was just like a nice thing to include. The reason I put it on the video is because I think it is sometimes nice, like when you really want to see or if it really matters, like you have a, a post-op stomach. But for like just routine things that I think like it's going to be really straightforward anatomy and the patient's not too obese, I just like dive bomb it in the AP and then just, you know, as soon as you pull back and you get air, that's like almost confirmation enough. And then you inject the contrast and you see Rugal folds. I mean, it's like, where else could you be? So I feel pretty confident, like just going straight AP is totally fun. Yeah. You know, just on a side on, on that, you know, position of the II, you know, one of the guys in my group, he actually does the whole G2 placement in the lateral position. He was trained that way because he said, this is how you never hit the colon. And I thought that was interesting. You know, when you insufflate the stomach, you can confirm in lateral that yes it's the stomach it's a, it can be a little bit challenging when you have gas in the colon and the stomach and then sometimes in the small bowel it's like okay where you know what's colon what's small bowel because sometimes small bowel when it gets filled up with air can even look like colon so you get it, it can be get confusing so he's like i just i just do it all in lateral and then that way my my hands out of the out of the rays and i can you know do it pretty and then and then when once he gets access then he can he brings it back to ap and then does it the rest in ap i thought that was interesting yeah no I, I think that i think that would totally work especially if you were trained that way i know that if i put the ii in the lateral position i would be completely disoriented <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. so like but if if that's the way you're used to looking at it and you know what everything looks like and, and all the position of it yeah i mean go for it but if i put it in the lateral position i would i would have zero confidence i mean other i mean not zero confidence but I, it would be a little disorienting so um, it, I think yeah, like you have to get, sure. a, I think I yeah. got to get a lot of licks in looking at it just that way. I have used that trick at times when, like I sure. said, gas just goes right through of and course. all of a sudden you can't tell what's what. And I'm like, okay, I just want to, I just want to make sure there's not colon in front of my stomach, right. In yeah. my access. And so it, it helps confirm that. Dude, give that glucagon, give that glucagon. That, yeah, there you go. No one's going to no go. get a hurt sure with glucagon. That time. So we talked about how the direction <laughs> of the yep. of of the access is important. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so I go straight AP for my T-tax, but then I'll angle it towards the pylorus whenever I'm going in for the actual gastrostomy tube placement. And I think I'll, anyone who's done a G to GJ conversion with like a surgical G-tube knows how important that angle is. Um yeah. and so 
I'll always just give it, I mean, it's not like super steep obliquity, but just maybe like 20 degrees directed towards the pylorus, I think makes all the difference if you have to bring them back for a conversion. And if it stays a G tube, then, you know, maybe you're out two to three centimeters in terms of length, but maybe not even that. Maybe it's really more like a centimeter in terms of like extra length from adding that 20 degree angle to the pylorus. Right. And, and you know, the other thing on that is um, it just doesn't make sense to angle it towards the fundus. Like, because again, you can keep your hands out of the ray as you watch everything, you know, everything go over the wire, right? Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're angling up towards the fund, then like basically to watch everything while you're pushing it, you, your hands are going to be right in the middle of the picture. So I think, I think there's that advantage as well, but yeah, if they ever need a GG to GJ conversion, then yeah, it's, you're, <laughs> you know, you might as well play something new if it's angled up towards the fundness because good luck getting that to uh, angle back and so it can be really have you ever difficult. have you ever talked to your surgery colleagues why they angle up i mean so th that's what exactly what they do they they angle like they direct their sticks towards the fundus have you ever talked to them about that i have not have you yeah i, I was like why, why the <laughs> f do you guys do this this is a nightmare and you know i mean one they don't put like a ton of thought into it but they're taught like that's like the most anterior portion of the the stomach wall and so, you know, mm. if you want to make sure that you're intragastric, like that's like the shortest distance from A to B. And so that's why they direct mm. it towards like their sticks towards the fundus. It's It's got no regard in terms of like, you know, potentially converting to a GJ. Okay. And, and honestly, mm. I think if you talk to a lot of them, they're probably, they probably don't, they're not aware that that creates an issue downstream. Um, yeah. And, and I have to admit, like, not that I'm trying to change the surgeon's practice at all, but like, if you, if you thought like you were like one was going to go to a GJ and like you asked them to like direct it, it probably, they'd be like, yeah, no sweat. Like I, they just don't put yeah. that much thought into it if I had to guess. Yeah. And then, you know, you want that, that wire purchase to be in the antrum, right? You want plenty of wire purchase. And then that way, when you're dialing over that wire, it's not, nothing's coming loose. Nothing's flopping back. It really helps to have plenty of wire down in, in you know, coiled within the, the antrum. Right, you know, sometimes it'll get in the pylorus. Yeah, I was always taught that you put, you fed enough wire in to where you were certain. It's just one more confirmation that you can see the wire touching two walls of the stomach. I mean, a lot of times you feed that wire in. I, I feed a ton of wire in. And then you can just see wire like, you know, pushing on like the, the lesser and the greater curvature. And like one, you have a yeah. ton of purchase. And two, like you're like, all right, know where I'm at. You know where you're at, exactly. Yeah, it helps confirm that for sure. Okay, so you dilate, get the peel mm -hmm. away in, tube goes in, you pull everything out except for the tube. What? How much uh, are you putting saline, water, or sterile water? What are you putting into the balloon? I, I want to back up because like the whole like crux or the whole like finicky part of it is like getting the tube through the peel away. Like that's when like <laughs> okay. all the problems happen or for me. So my problems happen when I try and like put the peel away in. And so like a lot of times it gets hung up. So you got to make sure your skin incision's big and you don't want to be like the last time you want to be futzing around with it is like after you've dilated and now you're putting the peel away in and you realize your skin incision's too small. That's, that's, that's right. not ideal. But sometimes like, I think like it helps to reinflate the stomach, like put some, like you, you've got the, the stomach, uh, incision or the, you know, the track that you've dilated, like tamp it it off with either like one of the dilators of the peel away sheath. And then you reinflate the stomach, like trying to like push into a deflated stomach, I think is like where you can get into some problems. Yeah. That's a good tip because, um, usually I have enough air left, but you're right. When you, I always pinch the peel away yeah. mm -hmm. and pinching mm -hmm. it to, just to keep the air from coming back out and being deflated, but that can also crimp it. So it makes it kind of challenging to get the G tube. But I, I always pinch it so that all my air doesn't come escaping through it. That's that's not a bad move. And I've heard of that. I think one of my partners does it. I don't I don't pinch it because I, I hate it whenever I'm trying to stuff the, the G tube in <laughs> and then it gets stuck in yeah. the peel away, which yeah. will happen. And so like one of the things that I do and everyone's got their own tricks, but when I'm prepping the G tube, like I always I don't always prep every part of it myself but one of the things i do is i will aspirate on that balloon because if you just take it out of the package it's just there's mm. just a little bit of air in that balloon and you can see it like get compressed yeah. whenever you pull back on it so i make sure i do that yeah. and then I also uh lubricate the gastrostomy tube and i think that makes it go through a little bit smoother yeah 
That reminds me of a funny story back to fellowship with Bream. I remember, I forget if it was a G2 or if it was like a, like a fistula we were ballooning, like a steno, you know, stenosis. But I, I had, I, I think it was a G2 and I had it on the back table and I went and I blew the balloon up on the back table and Bream walks over and he's like, why the hell did you do that? And I was like, because I'm just making sure the balloon works, right? He's like, no, we don't do that. <laughs> it's like, then you can't get it through the sheath. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I, every time, like every time bring, somebody brings that up, like getting that balloon to fit through, I always think about that. How what a what a stupid mistake I made back then, back in fellowship. I don't I don't know if that's a stupid mistake. It's very reasonable to test and see if your balloon works. <laughs> I mean, that's like standard operating procedure for a lot of things that we do. But yeah, you want it nice and slim. You want a nice slim G tube. But we don't do that for angioplasty balloons either. No, you no, want no. It to I, stay I, slim, right? Look, look, I, I'm totally with you. I, I, I was just thinking of that <laughs> as I said it. Um, but I was thinking about like yeah. the Minx or um, like yes, uh, that's all I could think key, about yeah. was the Minx. Maybe that's really. what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, it's really just in that one case. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. it's just the Minx. I don't think about it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're just testing your instruments. I mean, I think that's okay. Yeah. And then the other <laughs> thing that I think is like kind of a trick that can can bail you out every now and then is for some reason, like if your G tube's not going and your PLA sheath kind of like falls apart on you, or or maybe not falling apart, but maybe it's crimping, or you just have this like it's getting like compressed at the skin site, and you can tell sometimes stiffening up your G tube. Like if you like, have you ever done that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can put a dilator into it. Usually it's like an eight right. or a 10 dilator, or you can put, I think it's like a six or a seven French 20 centimeter sheath, like a vascular you sheath. Could you do can that, put inside or sometimes yeah. even a compy. Sometimes yeah. people mm -hmm. just even put like a compy inside. Yeah. Yeah. That, that helps add some stiffness to it when you're pushing, trying to get it through there. Yeah. But honestly, when I do the peel away, like I pull out the inner and the wire. So I, I've, I've like bailed on wire access at this point. I don't know if, do you keep the wire yeah. in the peel away? I, so I usually will pull everything. Yeah. Uh, so the peel away comes off and, and then you just have the G tube in with the wire in. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I'll do is I'll connect my saline. It's usually just saline. I'll connect my saline to the balloon reservoir. And as I, I'll, I'll inject you know, five cc's and I'll start to pull back and then I'll pull the wire out and then I'll inject the rest. And so that it's snug. And then I was watching your video uh, where you showed that you want to get a final shot, right? That shows uh, the balloon, where the balloon is that, you know, make sure it's not, you know, looks like it's not going through your tubes, not going through the colon. Mm -hmm. You inject a little bit of contrast for that final shot. One thing that I'll do at the end there to get a real nice, pretty shot is I'll actually have the tech or the nurse add more air via the company and yeah. so that the, the the stomach's nicely inflated and then you can really see your balloon really well and you can really see your contrast go and i'll, I'll save that cine shot where i inject the contrast and it just shows it's nice like interluminal placement i think that, that's actually pretty slick um i like that yeah i think like it's very important to get a final shot to where i mean because I, I think like no one would take them off the table if they didn't think that they were in the stomach but yeah. i mean it like you want to make you want to make one hundred percent sure, and then it's almost like you want to make one hundred percent sure for anyone who wasn't there live that you yes, are absolutely exactly. one hundred. Like that's how yeah. I think about it. Is like, oh yeah, I know I'm in the stomach, like because there's a lot of like built in, like you know how the procedure went. But like if someone just had to look at your final shot, could they look at that injection? Whether you do a single shot or whether you do a fluoro save of a cine, like can they look at your images and say, yeah, he like he or she was in one hundred percent. Yeah. No, that I, I learned that from uh, one of the guys in my group too, is I was watching him do a G2 <clears> and every dilator pass, he would, it's easy. You just hit save for every fluoro, sure. uh, for any cine. So I started doing that just to, for documentation purposes to show every step that I took here, it shows that I was intraluminal uh, and I wasn't going through the colon. Right. So um, I, I just started doing that just for good documentation. That's good. That seems like a lot to me, but <laughs> that's still right. that's still good it's taking like up space that. but you know i mean yeah you're days, right with, so. yeah I, i'm with you data <laughs> data space is cheap but the reason i say that is because i have a, a partner like throughout the whole g-tube you get one picture one single shot at the end and it's like this is where the g-tube is and i'm just i mean it not oh, right wow. or wrong i mean that's like a, he doesn't have any higher yeah. complication rates than anybody but i'm just like oh 
Like Bream yeah. like kind of drilled it into us that like, you know, people will judge you on your pictures. And um, so one, yeah, I like my pictures true. to look good, high quality, collimated appropriately, and also to like be salient to like you can follow like what I was thinking as it was kind of happening. And no fingers or hands in the picture. It drives oh my me crazy God. when like oh, somebody's yes. finger will sneak in and the tech will go to save and I'll be like, stop, you know, slap <laughs> their hand. Do not save that picture. We do not want to see fingers or toes or any appendages. Like we, you know, that's just, no, it's bad, bad photography. I, I completely agree. So, okay. So let's talk about, okay. So the tube's in, um, mm -hmm. do you cut your buttons for your T-Tax at that time or do you just leave them there? Leave them in. Does anyone cut okay. them at the that the time? People I know do. They'll they'll oh, okay. um, they don't want to deal with because people will come back with like little eroded areas or not commonly, but if you know they're supposed to fall out on their own, right? Yeah. But right. sometimes what happens is you get an aggressive tech and they tighten that the rubber ring around it too tight, and then if you have a button underneath there, it kind of cuts in. It can cut into the skin, especially if they're already uh -huh. they don't if they have poor nutrition. They have okay. poor healing. Their you know their skin's not great, so they will actually get develop like some ulcers or your little you know irritations there. And so I know people because of that they've seen that they'll just cut it right there because they're like, well, the T tag doesn't really serve any purpose anymore. The tube's in, the balloon's there, and so I don't though. I still trust that they're going to fall out because I want to I want to make sure that that stomach stays pexied up against the wall <clears throat> yeah. so that if somebody starts feeding them too soon or or you know that let's say that that the rubber ring loosens up you still have mm -hmm. the the pexy to help keep everything there and so I I leave them in until you know and then they they tend to fall out I'm in the exact same yeah. way um wait for them to fall yeah. off if they haven't fallen off by uh 1 month then I cut them off and I like them there also because you know, I mean, the the ring can loosen up on the gastrostomy tube. I mean, I don't know. I feel like a lot of things can happen with the tube, but not necessarily a lot of things are going to happen with your gastropexy tax. Like, I, I would want them in there yeah. for, like, that tract maturation. But at the same time, I'm sure if people are cutting them and getting away with it, I mean, I wouldn't even say getting away with it. I'm sure there's some good reasons to cut them, and those patients also probably do very well. Yeah. So what do you put in the balloon? Sterile water? 10 cc's. Saline? 10 cc's of saline, yeah. Saline, so you don't use the package yeah. insert recommended sterile water. Oh, um, <laughs> I usually the technologist hands me saline. I've never had issues with saline, knock on wood. But um, I, you know, I, I I understand the reason why it's water. I guess the balloon can start to what is it like it it can mess with the rubber of the balloon or something the saline over time. But I've never had any issue. I don't I don't even know what the reason is for the water. Do you? I've heard a couple of different things. I heard, I mean, so like your, your three good options or your three options usually are the sterile water, um, which isn't always as readily available on a back table as normal saline or contrast or like some kind of form right. of dilute contrast. And I've heard that if you do dilute contrast or, or whatever contrast, then water like osmotic pressure will bring more right. water into the balloon. You could risk rupturing it. My answer to that, I mean, if, if you're actually worried about that, have you ever tried to inject too much water into a gastrostomy to balloon to rupture it, they're hard to rupture. Right. Right. And 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 I think I I imagine that's the same reason why uh you do stir water over saline is because of the osmotic like I guess if somebody drinks a bunch of water, then osmotically it could go into the balloon for the same reasons of, of the contrast. Yeah, but I don't that that's one of the things I've heard. I don't actually know if that's the true reason. I've also heard sometime or one time someone told me the osmotic thing was BS, and it's actually because like the saline or the contrast will crystallize into the balloon, and sometimes oh, okay. it'll create a like so you get like a sediment buildup or something along those lines, and it actually makes and then it you hard can't completely to, deflate it. Yeah, then it makes it hard to deflate. Um, yeah, I, th I think these are both in theory things that can happen, but in practice, like I've seen people do it right. all kinds of different ways with, you know, sterile water to saline to contrast straight up to dilute contrast and all of them, all the tubes kind of end up being okay or all, all the uh, balloons yeah. end up being okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Again, no issues thus far with 10 cc saline. Uh, that's what we do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Okay. Actually, then, use actually uh, use the sterile water though. I do use the sterile water. <laughs> oh, do you? So, yeah. do they have to pull sterile water just for you? Yeah. So they have to they have to pull oh, sterile gosh. water just for me, and I think I'm the only one who does sterile water. Um, yeah. So they even have to remember it just for me. But like I tell my techs all the time, they're like, "Oh, you're you're kind of particular," and I'm like. And I used to tell them I'm particular because like everything's got a reason behind it, but it turns out I'm just kind of a particular <laughs> guy and I like it the way I like yeah. it. And I, I don't know yeah. how to explain it. So it's just yeah. particular, but I tell you what, it's like, if you're like, if you have like your text keeping track, like very like small details, like even if they don't get the sterile water right, they get all the other stuff right. And so yeah. sometimes I'm particular and it keeps them on their toes. I don't know if that's really true, but in my mind, that's what's happening. Well, that's a good, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they know I, I'm a particular I, guy. They know, like, I don't, I don't let yes, anything go. Right. Don't let anything go. Right. So they're going to be on their A game when mm -hmm, you're coming yeah. in for your yep, G tubes. Yep. All right. So, what, pros procedure. What do you, what orders are you put in for these patients? Inpatient or outpatient? Inpatient. Inpatient. So for the inpatients, I'll don't use the tube for. I don't say 24 hours. I say don't use the tube until IR has cleared the tube. And so even if I put it at eight in the morning or like four in the afternoon, I'll clear it whenever I'm making rounds in the morning. And so it just says, you know, wait to use the G tube until IR is cleared. And I'll usually clear it first thing in the morning. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, these are all ICU patients. And so I don't have like a lot of things about bed rest. I don't have a lot of like pain medications, which would totally be appropriate, but they already have all this stuff in. So I'm not, messing with their uh, pain regimen that's already in place. And then I uh, say, don't use the nasogastric tube for three hours after the procedure. Okay. Like don't, don't feed them until like three hours after the procedure. Three hours. Wow. So I think I was trained at Vanderbilt. It was 24 hours, but in our practice, usually it's the next morning. So if there are no peritoneal signs, like no pain, abdominal distension, or fever, then they're okay to feed them to start using the tube the next morning at 6 a.m. So they could like, you know, give them breakfast or their morning medications. So we usually will will just wait like a good evening, basically. And then otherwise, sometimes they need an abdominal binder because their their mental status isn't great. And they, they you know, we know we, we worry they were going to pull it out. So a lot of times I'll add an abdominal binder if if they're old or senile. And then, yeah, you know, the typical kind of post sedation orders for vital signs and looking for signs of bleeding, stuff like that. Anything else that. Hold on. So I know that, like, so I don't have them use the G tube for 24 hours, but they, you don't feed them or anything. They can't eat or not eat, but they can't oh, get like feeding oh, you're talking about feeding, tube. Feeding them. No, I'll hold off on that till the morning as well. Cause I mean, it's the same thing. You know, I mean, yeah, if the tube's misplaced, then it's emptying into the peritoneal space, but also the same thing can happen from above where, you know, you create this big hole. Let's say it was a complicated G tube and like you had to dilate or, you know, grab another dilator. Let's say you had to dilate, grab another dilator and then pull one out. You create mm -hmm. this hole and you may have rip, you may have created like a rip or something. I don't want anything in the stomach. And sometimes, especially when it, it's a problematic one, I'll actually put the G tube to low suction just to keep that stomach empty through the evening. Um, and that's probably overboard, but it just gives me a peace of mind that like they're not going to develop a peritonitis. I think that's totally reasonable. I, I see a lot of the low suction. Some people put the G tubes to gravity. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, all those things are reasonable. So, what about for your outpatients? Outpatients, you know, I always make sure they have a you know home health care already set up, right? I, there's been a couple of times where I go to a community hospital and it's Friday, and I you know. I walk in and on my board is a G tube at like 2 p.m. and it's an elderly person who has no home health care set up. They have no idea what they're having done. They were sent over by, you know, somebody in the community and it just was not scheduled appropriately. I'm not gonna put a G tube in them, send them home, you know, <laughs> after everybody's gone, and then they have no follow-up over the weekend. So I that's the most important thing for me is to make sure that they have follow up at home the next day. So they have to already have home health care set up before we even sure. schedule them for and so that somebody can check on them, make sure they're doing okay, get them to start their feeds and everything. So actually we'll talk to the referring doc about that if if it's not already set up. But otherwise it's very similar. I don't want them to use it till I don't want them to use it to the next day. I usually want them to kind of take a break. You know, they can have like clear liquids overnight but I don't want them eating a big meal by mouth. Usually they can't anyway. 
they you know the at best they might be able to get like um insure you know they might be able to get an insure or something like that but I, i'm gonna, i'm going to have them wait till the next morning to do all that so it's very similar i just want i i really want somebody to be able to check on them uh, other than a family member because family members don't know what to expect you know man don't your patients get really hungry i mean they've been in po for the procedure and they have to wait till tomorrow they must be so hungry yeah, you have the hungriest but I mean, patients usually in dallas they're their head and neck patients cancer patients i, know, I, know, I mean I know. they haven't been yeah. eating for like weeks you know and and i and the, I, d- I let them know. I said, look, this is not a benign procedure. Like you can get really sick if any of that food or insure or anything gets outside your stomach, you can get real sick real quick. And so I let them know, I'm sorry that you're, I'm going to starve you till the next morning, but it's just for the sake of, of safety. So for my outpatients, um, and we've, we've changed on this or like we've evolved on this a little bit that it, I think like when I was putting in my first G tubes, like I kept people overnight, which just like felt very excessive. But I mean, I, I, yeah. for some reason I just did. But now like we've gotten to the point where keep them three hours after the procedure, don't use the tube until the next day, slow feeding protocol. They'll see dietitian uh, or they'll see diet uh, nutrition before they leave if they haven't already been plugged in with dietary. And there's a slow flow, uh, there's a slow feeding protocol. A lot of these patients aren't ready to use their tube yet. Like we put it in before they've started radiation and surgery. So some of the patients are like still like, it'll be weeks before they use their tube, um, sometimes months. And actually, so we'll keep them three hours discharge. And then once they go home, I tell them they can eat. Yeah, those things are feeling okay. I mean, but I'm like, you know, you're going to have some post-procedure tenderness in that area anyway, you know, getting stuff, this big old tube. And so I, I just let them know, like, if it gets worse, if you develop a fever, if you your belly seems to be distending, just go to the ER. You know, just kind of basic stuff like that. Yep. That's that's pretty much it. And then I, you know, I have them follow up, uh, and then I, I I let them know that the referring doc will probably send us, you know, especially if it's an outpatient, send them back to us. Do you, do you already schedule like a follow up for an exchange just to help prevent clogging or G tube complications ahead of time, or is it just you wait till they send them over. So I usually wait for them to send them over. Um, it would be so, and th- this is a product of like our patient population. So for the inpatients that we do with this one OMSF surgeon, a lot of these patients are cu- like referred in. The reason we don't put the G tube in like a little bit ahead of time is because a lot of times they're coming from hours and hours away. And so they actually will have all their exchanges and like any maintenance of the G tube done at a like a, a different satellite area, not a satellite area, but just mm. a different area. Like they're not going to come like three hours, sometimes out of state to have like a G tube exchange. And so all that's set up through OMSF, like for a six month exchange after we put it in and it's not with me. Yeah. And then for the other patient population we have, which is very similar, they're all head and neck cancer patients. They're like under such tight uh, surveillance with Radonk that, like a lot of times we'll end up doing an exchange for, I just have a low threshold to do an exchange. Like if the patient's like, oh, I'm having like some pain at the side and I think the tube wiggled out a little bit. And so I'm like, all right, come in. And then I'll look at the tube. I'm like, oh, we got to change it. Like I'm always like, yeah. if it's like five months, I'm just going to go ahead and change it rather than like take a look at it and then see them back in a month. But basically yeah. I, w- I want to hit that six month mark. And if we haven't seen them for one reason or another at six months, Radonk will send them uh, to us for an exchange. Or if anything happens sooner than that, then we'll exchange it out. Cool. Anything, any new tubes you've heard about or new devices? I feel like G tubes haven't really evolved other than the bag technique uh, that Bream has implemented and, and trained people up on. I don't know of any new devices or techniques or anything around G tubes. Have you, do you, are you aware of anything? I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's, there's the slim G tube where you can get it in, you know, you can, um, you can get it through a smaller, uh, peel away sheath. There's, I mean, you know, you can take it a lot of different ways. You can, you know, leave your regular MIC type gastrostomy tube in, um, Mm -hmm. for like six weeks. And then you can kind of downgrade it to one of the Mickey buttons which yeah, some yeah. people like those are pretty slick. And what else was I thinking? I feel like there's all kinds of things with like tube management that you can talk about. Like one of the things that we do is I, I cinch the bumper down to the skin. Um, I think it's important to have like a snug fit. Like it's kind of like a, a friction yeah. fit, but not yeah. like too much where like the, 
like the disc is like digging in on their skin. Like I think that can ulcerate, right. but at the same time, it needs to be nice and snug to prevent leakage or re- reduce the chance of leakage. And then we've started putting like I just bought like a uh, hundred or maybe a thousand of them off Amazon. It's these little uh, zip ties. And I'll put a yeah. little zip tie around the base of the disc, and that just keeps it from slipping a little bit. One of my partners will, I mean, this isn't like an advancement in gastrostomy tube. It's just like people do all kinds of different things with their G-tubes to prevent problems. Um, but he claims that like one of the main reasons we get referred like for problems with G-tube is someone tries to mess around with how much fluid is in the retention balloon. Yeah. And so he'll, t- he'll take a pair of hemostats and crush it. Hmm. So no one ever wow, can then so access it. Up. You can never <laughs> access it from then on out. So if you ever, like if it comes to us, we can't like deflate the balloon or reinflate the balloon. You have to, it's, you're committed to an exchange. Like you have to cut the tube to release the balloon water or saline or whatever's in there. And then you have to exchange it after you've cut it. Interesting. Some people will, yeah, some people would tape over it. Like just to say like a, a bunch of tape over it, like kind of like indicating yeah. like, don't look at this. Don't mess with this. Don't mess with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Where do you cut it? People though? have, because people, you just cut it at the base and then like there's a little piece of tubing that you just never see it, but there's a small piece of tubing that runs all the way to the you balloon. Put a wire, I guess, do you put a wire down just to maintain access? Let's say it's fresh, somewhat fresh. If it were fresh, I probably would just to make sure I have access. Yeah. But, um, you know, most yeah. of the time, like if it's an established track, I just cut it, then put my right. wire down. Yeah. Got it, I mean, got same it. thing like we do yeah. for a, a lot of tubes, like, you know, like for a biliary or a gallbladder, you wouldn't put your wire in before you cut or for a nephrostomy right. tube exchange. Yeah. The mid key is pretty cool um, because it, it's, it's more flush against the, mm-hmm. um, the body. And I know people that are walkie talkie, like, you know, whether, it be, you know, it's people that just have nutritional issues or maybe ga- gastric outlet obstructions or stuff like that. They, uh, they really like that when you're able to convert it for them because it's not this thing sticking straight out. Mm-hmm. But it'd be nice to see some innovation in the field where it's a little bit, it reduces the amount of issues we have with tubes getting clogged without having to just increase the size of it, right? Or, you know, some of the other issues are people just pulling them out. Like, is there some other way that we can secure it so that we're not getting, the ER is not getting like all these G tube patients, you know, coming in? Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. I'd just be for the audience, you know, if you have any ideas or, you know, want to talk, you know, talk about anything, any kind of innovation on, on G2s, feel, feel free to write us in or, or, uh, message us on Twitter or, or leave, uh, a comment on this YouTube video. Chris, any, any last final thoughts? Yes. I would actually be shocked if a lot of people did not comment in because I think people have so <laughs> many comments on G tubes. It's like one of these procedures that, Everybody does. Everybody does them well. Everyone's got their own tips. Like, I think like for the patient, like just thinking about it, I think it's, I think it's good to be able to put in G tubes a couple of different ways. Like if you got a real player who, you know, wants to pull out their G tube, like, um, stroke patients, good example, pediatric population. Um, you'll have patients who are just kind of pullers. I think like the disc, like the pull technique is a good option because like those mushroom discs like that are on the inside rather than the retention balloon on the mic yeah i think that's a good i think like that's a good option to have like a lot of our i mean in our practice like that a lot of times goes to gastroenterology so they're putting in the disc i think those are way harder to pull out than our tubes yeah i mean even if there was like another material that wasn't rubber you know that was something a little Mm -hmm. bit more almost like bionic it would be interesting to see if there's anything any kind of innovation right like like imagine like a like a tesla port you know where it's it, it, it the nutrition's being fed in a different way but i'm I'm sure it'll come along at some point but um for now we i guess we yeah there's little things but overall g-tubes really haven't changed much in sure. the last mm-hmm. probably a few decades since they started putting them in uh, definitely, yeah. definitely in ter- in terms of like issues with G tubes, I don't think, you know, after post placement, I don't think there's been any improvement. I haven't seen any, you know, in terms of clogging. In terms of what do you, yeah, in terms of them clogging, in terms of them falling out. Oh my God. Um, that's a whole like another podcast. I call yeah. it like whenever we have problems with the tubes and like it, I just like 
like summarize it and say it was just tubology. Like there's just tubology. so much to like Let's do tubology. It. I mean it's yes. like it's like clogged G tubes, malposition G tubes, pain at the G tube site. Yeah. Cellulitis develops afterwards. Um there's all sounds kinds like of, a like, follow that sounds things. like a part two. Let's do it. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's actually like you're right. That's probably like something we should talk more about because there's yeah. all kinds of little, little things that you can do. Um I remember like when we were fellows, like I mean one of the f- First things that we would do in the morning is go unclog all of our tubes that like we had placed. And it's like, you know, just like nursing staff trying to like, you know, ground up a bunch of medications and send like yeah, 30 pills exactly. through like a 16 French G tube. And man, I would just go with like a bunch of, I just have like a whole these 60 CC syringes like in my, in my lab coat pocket. And I would just go and just like inject a bunch of air through all of them, just like blowing them clear every morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and there, now there's there's somebody just like you doing it right you know right now today probably I have no doubt fighting yeah. fighting the good fight yeah good, good doc over out there but yeah like there's i wish there was one more thing i was going to say oh um i would also be interested in, in seeing like everyone's commentary about like what they do with their g-tubes post procedure because I, I think like you'll see people all over the map like i bet you there's people who for outpatient g-tubes they send them home in an hour i know that they do and there's people who will keep you there overnight there's docs yeah. who will bring patients back and before anything is done they'll do a second injection of the gastrostomy tube 24 hours afterwards just to make sure it's still in the same spot before feeds are initiated and so it's all over the spectrum i know that I think it was MD Anderson. They came out with a paper uh, talking about like early G tube feedings. Like I think like it can happen as early as like six hours after you place a G tube on an inpatient. So like it's early initial early initiation of feeding or something. I forgot the name, but we can link to it. So I think there's people who are like all over the map in terms of how they manage this stuff afterwards. Yeah. Well, I hope our audience got some out of today's discussion. And again, there are other ways to place G tubes. There's uh, for any trainees out there, if you want to learn about the bag technique, Peter Bream's got a great video on YouTube. And then there was Mm -hmm. the pull through technique, which um, I know some people are getting trained at at their programs. I don't know if I'm going to recommend going back to episode two. I don't think that that's a good idea. I think that you should just take our word for it that it was an oak. Peter Bream and Aaron Branders are amazing people and probably just. You direct Twitter them if you want to learn more about their techniques, but do not go back to episode two. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I also listened to episode two. It was a little painful listening yeah. to it. We've come a long, yeah. we've come a long way, but I yeah. think we probably just need to get Bream on to re-record it, like a yes. remastered session. We'll get Brandis to talk about the pool technique. Get Bream to talk about the bag. We just, yeah. it's just too tough to listen to that old episode. Yeah, those could be part two and part three of this one, and then part four tubology. Yeah. Who thought? Who would have thought we'd have like a G tube university. I'm telling you, there's just you there's just so much you can talk about this stuff because the you can layer I mean, for simple procedures, you can layer on the complexity and people and like G tubes is one of those things where people feel differently about it and they and it's interesting because not only they feel differently, but they feel strongly about the way they do it. Yeah. And so that's what I've always found interesting about G tubes is like not only like do people differ on their practice patterns, but they're like, This is why I do it. And if you don't do it this way, peritonitis and death is right around the corner yeah so exactly yeah. that's why I, I think like having this and like having the commentary will be very fun all right well great place to to end it thank you to our audience and keep an eye out for those subsequent episodes we'll be i'll be reaching out to peter bream after this all right thanks chris all right thanks Aaron. thank you so much for listening if you haven't already make sure to subscribe rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhirter, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.